Whenever I see a camera coming to me, I have to do that. Um, first, I'll try to do a quick introduction. My name is Steve Rosted. Uh, last year, I had a different shirt here and a different background. Uh, I kind of changed companies before I used to work for Red Hat. Now I work for VMware. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details uh, about that, but if you want to talk to me offline, sure, I'll go ahead. Uh, I spent, well, I worked for 10 years with Red Hat uh, working on the real-time patch. Uh, how many people here are familiar with the preempt RT patch? A few people? Okay, I'm one of the original developers working with Ingo Molnar, Thomas Kleckner, Peter Zolstras, and others uh, on that uh, patch. I started working on that around 2004. Um, a, a new scheduling class is in the kernel called Sched Deadline. First, let me see, does anyone here know what Sched Deadline is? Very, very few. And how many people have actually tried using a uh, program that uses, utilizes SCED deadline? None. That's why I'm giving this talk. Okay, so, uh, let's see. Is this thing on? No, it's not on. It would be helpful if I did that. Okay, so what is SCED deadline? Well, it's a new scheduling class. Uh, along with the other scheduling classes, like SCED Other or Normal, uh, that's what the default is, uh, SCED RR, SCED FIFO, and there's a few other things, SCED Idle and SCED Batch, but those I'm not gonna talk about. Um, it utilize, or it's implemented with the concept bandwidth scheduler, and it's the earliest deadline for scheduler. I'll explain those on my way. First, let me talk about the uh, um, other schedulers. Um, when you, first of all, how many people actually use Linux? Hey, most people. So when you start your tasks, pretty much every task you have starts off with sched other. Um, it uses the completely fair scheduler by uh, Engel Molnar, and uh, it tries to break up tasks fairly, giving it all uh, equal amount of CPU time. So when you run your desk, you know, uh, Mozilla browser and your LibreOffice utility, it, it looks like they're both going the same time, but they're not, uh, if you have one CPU. If you have multiple CPUs, they could actually go at the same time, but uh, it spreads out among the CPUs, uh, giving each process amount of the CPU time. And you could change how much one process gets compared to the other with a nice value. A nice value is a nice command that you could say, hey, I wanna make this operation either more nice or less nice. What that means is if you make it more nice, it gets less priority. If it's less nice, it gets more priority, and it's not nice to other tasks because it hogs the CPU. But it's all kind of, um, it's not very uh, predictable in exactly how much uh, time things get. Uh, then introducing of Sched FIFO. Sched FIFO is a real-time task. It has 100 priorities, so that way you could actually tell a task, say, you know, task one, two, three, four, all the way up to 100. Higher the number, the more, the higher priority is. There is no task sharing per for the Sched FIFO tasks. When the highest priority task runs, it will run until it says it gives up the CPU, or a higher priority task comes in and preempts it. Uh, so it's FIFO goes first in, first out. And then you have Sked RR, which I think last year I talked a little bit about Sked RR saying it's a horrible scheduling class because it's also kind of unpredictable because what Sked RR does is it shares the CPU only among tasks of the same priority. So if you have two tasks of Sked RR with different priorities, the higher priorities will run just like Sked FIFO. Uh, it does, it's not gonna give up the CPU for anyone else. And the reason why I say it's a horrible scheduling class is because there's no POSIX or compliance on how much CPU time it's going to split up. It's just going to say, this, this process will get the CPU and it will share the CPU, but there's no, you don't know how much it's going to share among each other. So, talking about priorities. Say if you have um, a nuclear power plant. And this nuclear power plant has a, is trying to save money, so it has one computer and has one CPU. And it's gotta run two applications on this one CPU. One application actually runs, you know, make sure the nuclear power plant doesn't blow up. The other one um, runs a washing machine to, because the washing machine is to clean the lab coats of the engineers. And you would wonder which one would get the higher priority. The nuclear power plant, let's say, takes 50% of the CPU, but it only needs to run half a second every second. If it doesn't, make, if it doesn't get that half second, it, things will go wrong and the nuclear power plant will get unstable and bad things can happen. Um, the washing machine needs to run, you know, about 25% of the CPU, but it's only doing it at very much smaller times, you know, 200 milliseconds for uh, 50 milliseconds. Uh, so who gets the higher priority? If you had to decide, who would you give the higher priority? Most nuclear power plant or washing machine? <laughs> no one's raised their hand because you're afraid of, you know it's a trick question. 
but most people will say, okay, nuclear power plant, because you know, if that goes wrong, things blow up. So if you have, if you look, take a look at how nuclear power plants look, or the, the scheduling of this, like remember, this is all on one CPU, not two CPUs. If it was two CPUs, it would look like this, and everything would be very nice. And you have like, you know, every half second, nuclear power plant runs one second. So let's put it to one CPU. We have this. The nuclear power plant runs, and the washing machine will fail its deadline every time because its deadline is only is 200 milliseconds, um, and it, it gets blown away. It doesn't have enough time to do any cycles, so the washing machine actually breaks and crashes, which means that the lab coats don't get clean. And without clean lab coats, uh, the engineers won't go in and handle the nuclear power plant, and the nuclear power plant becomes unstable because there's no one manning the desk. So the system failed. So. How do we do this? Well, we make the prior we change the priority so that the washing machine actually is a higher priority than nuclear power plant. And believe it or not, this actually works fine. Even though you'd say, why would I give a higher priority to a washing machine over a nuclear power plant? It's because you can't, when you determine priorities, you look at the entire system. And it's not about what you think is most important. That's not, priorities have nothing to do about importance. It's, what, it's about what makes the system work and how things are scheduled. By the smaller, pri reason why we, uh, it's a washing machine is because it's a smaller uh, deadline. And I'll talk about that. So this is called rate monotonic scheduling. Now, whenever you see RMS in the open source world, you think rate monotonic scheduling, right? Few people get that joke. Uh, anyway, it's basically we look at computational time versus period. So the period is when, is it, when does the thing have to be done? And the computation time is how much CPU does it actually require within that period? Uh, the rate monotonic scheduling says the smallest period gets the highest priority. So you could do this, in, you could um, implement this in Sched FIFO. So you just say, okay, this has a small period, we'll give this the highest priority and just done. And the utilization, the U there, is basically the sum of all the tasks, computational time over a period. So let's add a dishwasher to the mix because, you know, the, the engineers like to have their coffee and they need their coffee mugs. And without their coffee mugs, they're, they're tired and they're not going to go into that thing. So we had to get a dishwasher in there as well. But we have a more efficient washing machine. So instead of the washing machine taking 25% of the time, it takes only 12.5% of the time. So actually we do all the calculations. Remember I said the utilization is how much uh, time we have per um, uh, computation time over uh, period. If you do the thing, it's like, well, we have 95.8% 90, of the CPU is all we need. So that's less than 100, so let's try it out. Well, so we run, we have the, you know, the washing machine goes off, and, or, and it runs for, like I said, one second. Remember, the thing is like, um, it's only one out of eight. Uh, we're doing, we're doing one, a millisecond as our uh, unit, so uh, one out of eight is the washing machine, three out of nine is the dishwasher, and five out of ten is the uh, nuclear power plant. So one, first the washing machine goes off, then the uh, dishwasher goes off for uh, the three out of nine, and remember this one, now the Nuclear power plant. When it hits um, to the fourth here, remember, one out of eight is the washing machine. So the nuclear power plant only ran for four units when we hit unit eight. Now the or washing machine has to go on to make its period. And guess what? You know, three out of nine is the dishwasher, so it starts to run. And now finally the nuclear power plant gets, but it didn't make its deadline. It failed. But how did this happen? We had less than 100% utilization, right? So, unfortunately, with rate monotonic scheduling, the best thing you do is this formula. Now, there's lots of papers out there that does all this, and they figured out uh, the best, the only time a rate monotonic scheduling can um, guarantee a, uh, a deadline, to make all your deadlines, is through this formula. N is the number of tasks. So if you have um, N times, Two to one over the uh, two to the power of one over n minus one is the best you could get. So if we go back and look at our formula that we did here, remember we had 95.8 percent. But if we plug in those numbers, we get only we only guarantee up to 77.9 percent. So just under 78 percent utilization of the CPU. So for those that like calculus and really like to do limits, this is actually I, I, I haven't figured this one out, but someone actually did figure this out. If you limit n to infinity. Uh, that formula turns into um, a natural log of two. So approximately just, you know, 69.3% 6, is the best uh, rate monotonic scheduling could give you of the utilization of the CPU. So if you 
69%, about just under 70. So that's the best you're going to get for uh, utilization. But you know, that's a lot of unused CPU. You know, that's like a third of the CPU that's not being used. So then comes in SCED deadline, which is um, which implements earliest deadline first. What this means, it has dynamic priorities, and this guarantees a utilization of 100% of the CPU. Obviously, that's hand waving because you have overhead and scheduling, and there's real re real. Uh, problems that I gave a talk last year about, you know, real-time systems uh, are not predictable, but if, if on, a, on a perfect system uh, with no overhead, no interrupts, you know, scheduling switches of, you know, one, zero, um, context switches of zero you, uh, time to do, you could have 100% utilization. So if we take the same um, algorithm and we say start off with the one unit with the washing machine, go with three units with the dishwasher, and at the four units with the um, um, nuclear power plant, if you look here, the, the dishwasher doesn't go off, or the washing machine is not going to go off again because its deadlines actually pass, it's into the next period, it's far away. The next deadline is number 10 from the uh, nuclear power plant. So it actually executes and finishes within its deadline and everyone's happy. Then everything else continues. So to implement a real-time priority, if you ever, anyone here ever write a, a real-time task. A few hands go up. So you're probably familiar with uh, SCED set scheduler. And this is how the, what you write. You use SCED param, you set your param, um, you, set, you pass in the policy, whether it's, this policy is SCED FIFO or SCED RR. Uh, there's headers that you pull in, and then you pass in your uh, parameter there, and you get SCED priority. Uh, the thing is, we, don't, we can't change that interface, because Linus gets mad if you break user space. And we had to come up with, the way to get around this is we came up with two new system calls. Not really new, they've been in since 3.14. But the system calls here for, uh, you, could use, you, could, you could use these to set your um, um, applications to use SCED normal, SCED other. You could even, I believe you could even do nice, nice values and you could even do, um, uh, yeah, you could do nice values and you could set up for priorities of SCED FIFO and also SCED deadline. The main thing is we pass in this uh, new structure. And the first thing is the size. The reason why we do size is because if we wanted to extend this uh, system call, instead of like before, we, our previous system call, we can't extend. This one, we pass in the size, so you, the application should check, the, you know, when it, um, should check the return value of the system call when you send it in. But if the size doesn't match what the kernel expects, uh, the kernel will say, hey, um, I don't support this. So if a new feature happens, you could test if that new feature, or if it's extended, by putting in the size of your structure. If we append anything else, the kernel will allow all old sizes, but also will allow new sizes. So if the kernel is only works with, the if you use today's kernel and you a new feature happens and you make an application based on that new feature and you run it on today's kernel, passing the size, the size is gonna be bigger than what the kernel knows about, so it's going to come back and fail, saying, I don't know this, uh, I don't know your uh, size. This is, I guess, how sockets work as well. So normal code, if you want to implement inside your uh, uh, program, a SCED deadline task, you just, you set up your deadline, and I haven't talked about, um, oh yeah, SCED deadline, you put in your runtime and your deadline, and you pass everything in, and there's your, um, your task is now running periodically. SCED yield. How many people have program, uh, see programmers that have used SCED yield? No hands? You're all good programmers. Oh, you guys failed. <laughs> you're all, basically, you're all good programmers because almost every time I've seen SCED yield used in C code, it's been buggy. Uh, the reason why is because SCED yield just says, hey, don't schedule me out. Just let anyone else running run instead. Now, remember what I said before about the scheduling policies, it's up to the kernel to determine what runs next. And most likely, like if you're a SCED FIFO and you're the highest priority task, uh, it's just going to run you again. It's not going to run anything else. So a lot of times, uh, you could get into infinite loops. If you require a SCED yield to work, um, most likely it won't work as you expect. The only time actually SCED yield actually works if you want to implement voluntary scheduling. You use SCED FIFO, set everything at the same priority, and then SCED yield actually is, works for that, because it will, if you have uh, four tasks you know, running on the same CPU, all the same priority, with the one that's running does SCED yield, it will schedule out, go to the end back, it'll remember FIFO first in, first out, it'll actually go at the, back, uh, at the end of the queue, and the next one will run. So you can actually implement your own scheduler by doing that, but that's, no, no one does that today anymore. Um, SCED other, SCED yield does kind of have work a little bit, 
but I guess it's buggy code. And the reason why it's buggy is I've seen this actually, this is actually code changed a little bit uh, to, pr to protect the guilty. Uh, I've seen this, you know, someone grabs a mutex and what happens is that's, if right here in this case, uh, mutex B has to be grabbed before mutex A. Uh, but for some reason, you know, you do mutex A and then you've got to do some work and then you have to grab mutex B and you say, oh, darn it, I, you know, I can't, if I grab it here, I could possibly do a deadlock because somewhere else is going to grab B and A. And if anyone knows about locking, that causes deadlocks if you grab locks in different orders between threads. Um, so what they do is this, they do, okay, we'll try lock. If we don't get it, we'll release A because, you know, let, you know, the owner of B continue to run. Sked yield, go to again. Unfortunately, um, if you're the highest, if you're using sked FIFO tasks, you're the highest priority task and you preempted the owner of uh, B, you're just going to go into a spin and B is never going to get to run. That's why it's buggy code that people don't always expect. The funny part is we're bringing sked yield back into a useful case that's actually really useful. Sked yield is now the way to tell this kernel that if you're a sked deadline task to say, hey, I'm done with my computational time for this period, let me go and wake me up at the next period. So sked yield actually is something functional with when doing a sked deadline. It actually isn't buggy code. So yes, you could use sked yield again if you're using sked deadline. Concept bandwidth scheduler. This is, this is how um, sked deadline is implemented in, um, uh, <clears throat> in Linux. And one of the advantages of constant bandwidth scheduler is the fact that it allows um, earliest deadline to work when you have things like tasks being blocked. Because earliest deadline doesn't always handle, you know, locking where you block on it something. The question is, if you block on a lock, you're not running, your computational time's not running, you may have the next deadline, how do you handle that? And what constant bandwidth scheduler does is it basically does, when you wake up again, it just reevaluates you. And it'll say, hey, is my remaining runtime, you know, less than, uh, or remain run time divided by um, my net, how much uh, deadline I have left. So my remaining executable time and the remaining period. If that is greater than, if that percentage is greater than my actual uh, percentage, I'm going to move everything over. I'm going to say, okay, my deadline, I'm going to add my deadline, push it forward, and add my remaining run time. This is great for having um, correct percentage of the CPU but it's not really great for making your deadlines if you really require periodic timing. Uh, reason why, um, so basically you have your task that here we have, let's say we need a computational time of three and our deadline's at nine. And we get blocked after one unit. But then we wake up at six. Now, you could see we could actually make our deadline. You know, we could say we have two more, but because, um, the dep uh, what happened was because the, uh, oh, I didn't have it in there. Ah. Oh, here it is. Because two divided by three, which is um, how much runtime we have left compared to how much deadline we have left, because there's you know, nine minus six, there's three, and we have, still have two more units to run, that percentage is still is greater than three over nine, you know, one, th one third. So two thirds greater than one third. So what we do is we move the deadline out and we give ourselves extra, time, so we actually we run more. But the problem with this is, um, hey, I got connected here. Um, get rid of that. The problem with this is we actually, um, well wait, let's add another deadline task in here. Okay, if I run another deadline task, go back, so this is our time. Say in the meantime, another task is running, remember we pushed our deadline out, and we, another deadline task wakes up that has a shorter deadline. It pushes us out more, so we get to run again, even though the constant bandwidth scheduler says everything's good, we're getting the proper amount of CPU time, here we missed our original deadline. So this is one of the things you have to watch out for with using the current implementation of SCED deadline. We have fixes that are working on this. My favorite machine, the donut hole puncher. Everyone loves donuts and you have to have your donut hole. So you think of a conveyor belt with donuts spinning down on it and you popping out the donut holes. Um, if you're, you have to, it, the periodic scheduler is required on this because you have to go off at a certain deadline, go on. But like I said, the period itself isn't long enough. You know, our period goes from one hole to the next hole. 
So we may run in a specific amount of time, but we may be off where we go because something else might be running. So if, you have, if you're off, you might have lopsided donut holes, or even worse, it's going to hit on the side, and it's going to make it look like someone took a bite out of your donut. You don't want that. So we're introducing a deadline versus period. What a deadline means is not only is your, um, uh, when your executable time starts, your deadline's shorter than your period. So you actually have to execute right away or within that deadline, you have to get your computational time has to be within that deadline and not till the next period. So that's where the donut machine has to come down. Like as soon as the donut passes, okay, that's where it starts. It's got to shoot before, it's got a little bit of a leeway, but it's got to run because the deadline's really, really quick. Uh, but this, this could be too constraining, by the way, because what you, to analyze utilization, it's the deadline, not the period, that matters. So you know, if you're using a small deadline, um, if, it's, if your full runtime and your deadline are almost equal, that's utilization of one. That means you can't run anything else without, and you'll, you can't guarantee it will work. So if you have like one unit out of 10, that's your deadline, and you're running computational times one, that means that's 100%. And that, even though you have nine units of unused CPU, the CPU is basically idle, you can't run another deadline task on that, otherwise it's, it could fail. So, what happens when you uh, use the constant bandwidth scheduler with deadline tasks? Well, you could cheat the system. Say if your scheduler, here's a little, this, bit, this has been fixed in Linux, I'm not gonna explain, I don't have enough time to explain how it was fixed. But let's say if you're being constrained, or if, you're, if uh, the admin's saying, we're gonna constrain you, and, but we're gonna give you this amount of uh, CPU uh, for this period, but we're also gonna give you a specific deadline. So what you could do is, here you have a task that has uh, only two units of runtime. Uh, the deadline's four, so it's that two units has to run within that four, um, uh, block of four, or units of four. And, you're, and when, after you've done with your two units, you have to wait till the 10th unit before you replenish and could start running again. But let's say after one unit, you're just going to sleep or you cause yourself to block on something or just go to sleep. And you, wake, and you sleep for two units and you wake up at three. You know, you have one unit left, but because the one to one is greater than, remember I said this is the constant bandwidth scheduler, since the one to one is greater than the two of four, we move everything out, your deadline gets moved and you, you get replenished. So you run for your one unit. But let's say you go to sleep again. Everything gets pushed and it gets runs out here and you can do this again. Notice within the 10 units, I ran four units. I doubled my, uh, how much time the admin gave me. So this is a way to cheat. We actually fixed this. But this is one of the problems with the constant bandwidth scheduler. Then there's multiprocessors. So everything gets, is, this is where things just go really, really wrong. We have multiprocessors. Um, you have the, what's called the Dahls effect, which means that you can't get more than utilization of one. Now, if you have two CPUs, ideally your utilization should be two. Four CPUs, four, eight, eight. But with the, with the early deadline first, even without the constant bandwidth schedule, but with early deadline first, you can't get more than one. And here's how it works. I'm not going to read through this. But let me just real quick say that we have, um, let's see if we do, yes. Let's see, uh, let me make sure if this is right. We have two or three tasks. Uh, two tasks ha use two units out of nine. One task uses nine units out of 10. Now, if you do the calculation, it's only 1.34% or 134%, uh, or 1.34, which is less than two. We have two CPUs, we should have up to 200% uh, utilization. But we only, um, what we just did was 1.34. Now, Dahl's effects goes, is a little bit different than this. This is just for simplicity to make it easier to understand what it means. So you have the two tasks, since they have the shortest deadline, since their next deadline's at nine, and the other task that runs out of nine units out of 10, um, its deadline's at 10. So the two, with the two units, run first. Well, guess what? You know, nine out of 10 is going to put you at 11, you're going to miss your deadline. That's why the Dahl's effect uh, talks about this. So, early deadline first cannot give you more than a uh, utilization of one. Um, now, there's ways you could go around this. There's partitioning, basically binding each CPU, treating each CPU like um, 
a single CPU, and then you could get util one uh, utilization of one on each CPU, but nothing to migrate. So if there's any leftover idle time, you can't use that. You can't have a task from one CPU, a task on one CPU going over to that CPU, use it. So <clears throat> if you try to partition it, you have some strange uh, deadlines. You have like 0 0.6, 0 0.6, and 0.5, and it can be hard to deal with this. Uh, it's still uh, under like, say, three tasks, um, that's, uh, if you add them up, it's still under two, but uh, it's going to be hard to figure out how to schedule them. And if you really want to try to figure out how to partition things, when if you get lots of CPUs and lots of tasks, it becomes the uh, packing problem, which is MP-complete. I mean, you're not going to be able to figure this out. You can't have the, you can't have the kernel trying to figure out this out for you either. Um, so we have this one method is called the uh, global earliest deadline first. Uh, since we can't guarantee utilization of greater than uh, one for all cases, just like every NP-complete problem, if you constrain the problem, you could get a guarantee. And here we actually have a slight constraint. If you constrain the tasks that have been running, you can actually guarantee more than 1% utilization. So um, what we look at is we take um, the deadline. Well, first, let's to make things simple. We're going to say deadline equals period, okay, not the constrained deadline where it doesn't equal period. And then we look at Umax is the maximum uh, percentage of any of the tasks. So of all the tasks that we're scheduling, we're just, we, don't, we only care about the one that has the highest utilization of those tasks. And the guaranteed utilization is the sum of, the sum of all the tasks could be uh, the number of, um, let's see, was it CPUs? Yeah, I think, my, or number of tasks, I think, or is it? I can't remember if M's number of CPUs or tasks, oh God, jet lag. Minus, minus one, so let's see here, yes, eight CPUs. So what we do is say here we have eight CPUs, uh, max utilization of 0.5, or no, maybe it's tasks. I should have wrote this down. <laughs> My mind's dead here. And then if you look at um, the max utilization out of having, yeah, it's eight, okay, eight CPUs, because it's, yeah. Because 4.5 is, yeah, in my mind. M is equal to CPUs. Yes. Ugh. So what this is, uh, what I'm saying is, uh, although we're not getting 800%, but we get 450% or utilization by, because one of the max uses half the CPU, half, 50% of the CPU. We plug in the notation where M is the number of CPUs. So number of CPUs minus, so 8 minus 9 times point, or 7.5 is 4.5%. Uh, or 4.5 utilization. Going back to our two CPUs and the 999, what I said, uh, from our previous example, we could have a max utilization of 1.001. Not that great. So the limits of dead sky deadline, and hopefully I'll see how much time I have, so if I have to speed up or not. Okay, I think I have time. Uh, so the limits of sked deadline, uh, It runs on all CPUs. When you create a CPU uh, a task under um, SCED deadline, by default, it's going to uh, migrate to any CPU. You can't set affinity. You can't limit it. You can't pin it. Well, you can, but it's very difficult, which I just got done explaining that one of the best solutions you can use, one of the easier solutions to do for SCED deadline tasks is to pin all your tasks and use each CPU as a separate CPU to get best utilization. Unfortunately, the implementation of SCED deadline in Linux uh, it makes it very difficult to pin tasks uh, because it makes the, uh, it, like I said, the bin packing problem. Uh, it causes all the guarantees to become extremely complex to calculate to make sure that your next uh, schedule, schedule deadline task you uh, call can make its guarantees. Because the kernel is supposed to tell you, yes, this will not you know, break or you know, cause the system to just run um, too much or too much utilization. It's supposed to make sure utilization doesn't go above what it can handle. Um, you can't fork a task. If you make it sked deadline and try to fork a tax, task, it's going to fail. Uh, and also, um, one of the biggest problems with sked deadline, and this is in any type of, without, not just Linux, but any type of use of sked deadline, is calculating the worst case uh, execution time. And I gave a talk last year at Kernel Recipes talking about how the system's so unpredictable because of cache, because of everything else. You don't really know how to calculate how much execution time do you actually need because the computer system itself um, causes issues or it makes it difficult, it's unpredictable. So you, what people usually do is they say, okay, I ran 100 tests and this, my, I get maybe five units of execution time 
on average, but because I don't know if the CPU is going to, you know, miss something that's going to come up, the TLBs will be flushed, branch predictions will be flushed, cache is going to be flushed, and even though it works fine in my test, when I put it in the field, it's going to be, you know, longer. Instead of giving it five units, I'll give it eight or nine. So you, at, people always overestimate. Again, now we're, we're causing um, the CPU not to be fully utilized. So, Say we want to make it give it, like I said, you can actually give SCED deadline affinity, but it takes a little bit of work. First thing you do is you can do it through C groups. And you create, um, you CD to CPU sets within your C groups. Uh, you create your little set. You create the other set for everything else, because you have to separate your task from everything else. So you say, this is, say I have four CPUs. So I'm going to say CPU 0 to 2 is going to go to all the other tasks. And um, I need to set MEMS. I only, I'm not going to go into detail why. And I need to set load balancing to make sure you know, the scheduling works only on these, the CPU. And now I have to make it exclusive, so it, oh, it's bounded. And then I say, OK, I'm going to make my set. I'm going to run my sched deadline task on CPU 3. And then I'm going to echo 0, do the same thing. And I have to make load balancing work. And then I have to make sure it's CPU exclusive. And then I. Uh, I have to make uh, turn off, now I have to turn load balancing off at the top level, so it actually sets all the scheduling there. And that's a lot of work. I had to put that lots a lot, because I kept, uh, whenever I give this talk before, um, I didn't know when to end. This is why people don't always use get deadline yet. We're working on fixing this. And we're not done yet. Uh, once you got all that, now you have to move the tasks to your uh, tasks, and you gotta go through this, kind of run this a few times, because if there's something forks in the middle of it, you got to run it again. Um, and then you have to move your own sched deadline tasks to where you want to go. I already mentioned about uh, calculating worst case execution time. I'm going to skip over that. So, GRUB. The greedy reclaim of unused bandwidth. Now, everyone, when you hear GRUB or G-R-U-B, everyone here first thinks of greedy reclaim of unused bandwidth, right? <laughs> yeah, we love stealing acronyms. So, what this does is... Uh, This is one way for handling uh, worst case execution time. Uh, instead of giving tasks too much, uh, you're going to assume that a lot of the times the task only finishes its, co uh, executional uh, its computational time before uh, you, the, t the time they actually give it. So if say, to explain that in better terms, if you give a task two units out of 10, most likely that your CPU, your task is going to run with under that two units. So when you're done, you do sched yield, say oh, I'm done, and you give up the rest of your units to this global pool. So the kernel actually uh, looks at all this and keeps track of this global pool and um, other tasks that say, if you're going um, a little bit over your sched deadline, so if you, or say if you're only given two units, but you come up to that two unit mark, you can mark your task saying, this is a greedy task. Let it use other, uh, any, uh, bandwidth that another task gave up. And in most cases, this works nicely. You don't have to be so widely, cons like, you know, try to, you know, overestimate your worst case scenario. If you get a good average, add a little buffer more, and then you could just run and set a few tasks saying, well, I'm going to give a, some tasks a little bit more CPU, but everything should work out because it only uh, utilizes what another task hasn't used. So you're not going to break or not going to cause uh, like get other tasks to be starved. So there's new work on the horizon uh, to handle the affinity uh, to make this easier to do, and it's semi-partitioning semi of sked deadlines. So let's go back. Remember the Dolls effect example I gave you, and you said you had like two nine and nine of ten, and this is one of the reasons why it's hard to uh, can't set affinity. What the kernel is going to dynamically do is split up deadlines. So what it's going to do is actually it's going to, instead of doing that nine, uh, nine units out of 10, it's going to say, hey, I'm going to give it on one CPU execution time of seven, um, deadline of eight. So I'm going to minus one and still have the period of 10. And when it runs, it's going to run first because it has the higher priority. It's, it's deadline is eight, so it runs first. And then it's going to migrate to the next CPU to finish, it, finish the rest. And it's going to have two units out of nine and 10, so it could run. And here, we actually were able to, everyone was able to make their deadline nicely with this uh, breakup. 
And that's the doc, there's a bunch of links that you can look at. So hopefully I'll upload these slides somewhere and uh, you guys could download and look at this. And there, 81 slides. <laughs> <laughs> But, by the way, if you're at Colonel Recipes, I'm at my F Trace talk, I have 118 slides. <laughs> Questions? Come on, I want to throw this at someone. <laughs> oh, let's get the other. Actually, that's what the whole constant bandwidth, uh, or sorry, yeah, uh, constant bandwidth scheduler is about. It's to prevent those tasks from starving. In fact, um, usually uh, uh, when you boot up uh, Linux, it gives RT tasks and um, sched deadline tasks by default 95% of the CPU. Any task, RT, if you do a sched FIFO and do a run to a CPU one, it's going to throttle it at night and you'll get a splat on your a D message out there, but it's going to throttle it at 95%, and it's going to let other tasks run for 5%. You could turn that off. Uh, you, there's, it's in the uh, proc, sys, kernel, sched, RT, period, and stuff like that. So you could set that to negative one, and that just means, no, turn that off. And then if you do a sched deadline task that runs infinite loop, um, you're, you're going to lock up the system. Yes. Uh, in fact, right now, uh, sched deadline is the highest priority. T if you have RT tasks, sched deadline will preempt them. Remember I said RT task runs until a higher priority task will preempt them. All sched deadline, all sched deadline tasks by default, well, you can't even change it, uh, are higher priority than RT tasks. They run first, and then when they give up the CPU, because the whole point is they're, they, you know that they are only going to run a percentage of the CPU. They're not going to take 100% of the CPU. So. All the, the utilization numbers I was putting up there, uh, anything that's left over is for everything else to run. Yep. Actually, uh, this is the whole point of, I know it's, it is, a lot of it is theoretical, and a lot of this stuff is, a lot of people got PhDs out of doing a lot of this work. Uh, <laughs> and the new work that's being done right now is by PhD students. Uh, I do know of some, uh, industry that actually implemented SCED deadline, not on Linux, but on um, other architectures or under operating systems. Um, the ideal is basically if you have a periodic task and you could kind of figure out how much computational time, you should, you should just be able to plug them in as long as the utilizations are done. If you have one CPU, it's usually very easy with early SCED deadline first uh, because it, it's a dynamic processing. You should be able to handle even with multiple tasks. You, you, but the thing is, each of those tasks you have to calculate, figure out how much time each one needs, what the period is, and you just plug in those numbers and doing the simple utilization calculation of the percentage of each task, as long as it's under one for the CPU, it, the, it will should just work. Okay. Any other questions? Uh oh, it's not working? So did we just miss all those questions? And this is being recorded, I believe, too, so. It's just like I was talking on the telephone and you only heard my side. Thank you. Uh, from the user perspective, it's up to the task to define the amount of time it needs to be, uh, to be scheduled. Am uh, I right? Well, no, you have to, you just, it's up to the user to determine how much um, computational time they need and the period. So you actually have to plug it. Remember that one slide that said the system call? You have to determine, um, you just have to say, this task requires this much computational time within this period or this deadline and period. So, so for the same application, if you are running on different hardware, the, the value you have to set up are different because the yes. amount of time Each, I require to execute my task depends on the hardware capabilities. Yes, or also um, 
a lot of times it's when you're worried about bandwidth, uh, it shouldn't matter because it's the percentages will still be the same. Uh, it'll just be slower. If you if you need to get if you need your if you have hard periods, well then again you still if you, if you have a hard period, your computational times may change. But then you have to test the system out. You know, real time when you work on real time, and this should be if this is embedded Linux or the Linux res, uh, embedded recipes, uh, everyone here should understand that real time is not easy. Uh, you have to calculate the system. If you change to a different system, you got to reevaluate everything, and that's true of hardware, software packages. Uh, for true real time systems, you have to it's per the entire system, is one unit. Any modification to that system needs a full evaluation. Yep. Thank you. Anything else? Oh! <laughs> <laughs> that part doesn't have padding. <laughs> Thanks. How do you deal with uh, migration time in your calculations? Um, Oh, when you want to know about migration time, yes, that's one of the multi-CPU uh, and migration time. That's one of the issues about uh, worst case uh, execution time is migration. Yes, um, you have to. That's why if you don't want migrations, you pin everything. Um, that's the, how the best answer to deal with that. And yeah, if you care about that, the the other points is if you more like if it's more soft real time where you don't care, if, you know, you want more, just you're more worried about bandwidth. Uh, migration is much better, and those are usually if you're like uh, working in hypervisors and having guests, and you want to say, okay, this guest only gets this much CPU, this guest gets this much CPU. You don't really care about the latency between as much. You just want to make sure the bandwidth is correct. That's more the where you want migration. That's actually the higher use case for it. But when you're in an industry or something like that, I, just pin it to a CPU. That, that gives you the mo the least amount of variables. Okay. Anything else? Going once, going twice. Thank you very much. Thank you.